So today we're fortunate to have with us Elizabeth Broderick, the Sex Discrimination Commissioner, Anne-Marie Corboy, the CEO of HESTA, and Susan Buckley, who's the Managing Director, Global Fixed Interest at QIC. And all three women have significant roles and they have significant views on the topic as well, which they're going to share with us today. I've asked Liz to do an overview of the state of play in Australia in terms of women on boards and particularly to talk about where we sit internationally on the issue of board diversity. And we're then going to move to our panel and I've asked Anne-Marie to particularly focus on super boards and Susan on the investment community and women in, on boards in that area. So I'm now going to hand over to Liz Broderick to do an overview for us. So we're really lucky to have Liz with us to he here today. So please make her welcome. Thank you very much, Fiona. And it's a great pleasure to be speaking here today at the annual uh, Australian Superannuation Investment Conference in such a beautiful location. So thank you very much, Fiona, Kerry Pratt and the Women in Super um, group for inviting me to come here and talk to you about the issue of women on boards. Now, to those 20% who don't think gender diversity is important, I know who you are and I've got you booked in for a medial training already. <laughs> so we'll be meeting afterwards. But it is important that we have a lively discussion about this because it's a very live debate at the minute, particularly in corporate Australia. This is what I want to do today. Firstly, I think it's important that we examine the data. So we see where we, what the figures are here in Australia, but also where we sit internationally because this issue goes to our international competitiveness. Secondly, I want to do a brief overview of um, the ASX Corporate Governance Council's reforms um, and just mention a couple of things out of a Cooper review in relation to this issue and then to finally make some observations um, from having had numerous discussions in corporate Australia, also from the, uh, the observations that I have having been in the role of Australian Sex Discrimination Commissioner for almost three years now. And then finally, I would like to open up a bit of a discussion, which we might be able to take also over to the panel, about the issue of targets um, and you know, what other countries are doing in relation to targets and, in fact, quotas. But before I start, I do want to acknowledge the number of men in the room because it's terrific to be able, as Fiona said, to engage men in the discussions around gender equality. Because as you well know, gender equality is not a zero-sum game. It's not a situation where women win and men lose. It's about uh, both men and women coming together to create um, uh, to create equality, and I think that's important. Our lives are so intertwined that when something happens to women, necessarily it has an impact on men and vice versa. So let me start by briefly outlining um, the issue. These are things that some of you will already know, so I apologise if that's the case, but I think they are important so that we all have a common frame of reference. But here are the facts. And fact number one is that Australia is leading the world in women's educational attainment. The World Economic Forum came out with their gender gap report several months ago and we were in a group of about three countries including Finland and a couple of others who are leading the world on women's education. So we're educating our women better and longer than nearly every other country in the world. And you just have to look at our universities to see how well women are doing. I mean, in fact, this, this year I think over 63% of graduates from universities are female. And if I look at my own industry, law, it's in excess of 65% of graduates from law are female. But despite this, we have a declining rate of women's workforce participation. In fact, in the last year, we've dropped 10 countries. So we are, we're going backwards on that um, indicator of women's participation and paid work. And that has implications also in terms of women's economic security. Here in Australia, 59% of women are in paid work. If you go across to New Zealand, that's up around 62%. Um, if you go to the UK, it's around 67 And Norway, now it's well over 70%. So there's no question that women start with the same educational achievement, uh, the same level of intelligence and commitment as men, but the fact is they're missing in action at the senior levels. And to illustrate this, you really need to go no further 
than have a look at what's happening in corporate Australia. The statistics here come from EOWA, which is the Equal Opportunity in the Workplace Agency, their 2008 census of ASX 200, so they were looking at the top 200 companies, reveals that women hold 8.3% of board directorships, and at that time they chaired only 2% of boards. That's actually gone up, I think, to 3%. Um, in terms, and you can see that here, particularly in relation to management, the data that came out in 2008 told us that we were actually trending downwards. So um, we were actually down at back at 2004 rates. And the figure that I, I think is the most concerning is that in 2006, 7.5 per cent of um, line manager pro roles, so senior executive roles which had profit and loss responsibility were held by women, 7.5%. That has dropped down to 5.9%. And in fact, at the presentation at the Chief Executive Women Dinner last week, the most recent data shows that it's even dropping further away. Now, this is coming off a base where 63% of graduates from university are female and we're back around 5.9% or less in executive line management positions. And in fact, two months ago, the Governance Metrics International, a global ratings agency, released data that disclosed our global position. And their 2010 report, um, Australia was notable in that report for two reasons. Firstly, we've now dropped behind all our OECD counterparts on the number of women on corporate boards, with the exception of Japan. But secondly, we've had the largest decline over the last two years, together with Hungary, Peru, the Philippines and Poland. So what are other countries doing about it? And it was interesting because I went into the World Bank a couple of, a couple of months ago now to have a look at this issue in the framing of international competitiveness. So to think that you could remain competitive as a country while putting aside 50% of a talent largely on the basis of their gender um, is just not possible. And that's why a number of other countries have been working hard in the last two years to grapple with that. Internationally, there's really been a variety of responses to this problem. Uh, of women's underrepresentation at decision making. Most countries are seeing this issue as impacting on their international competitiveness, and so it will. That's why many countries are taking quite a radical approach, and you can see there the countries that have moved to mandatory quotas. Um, that is a legislative government imposed quota, and probably the one that's most talked about is the Norwegian quota, which is 40%, minimum of 40% both genders, so it's what they call a gender neutral quota, minimum of 40% of both genders on all um, company boards. But what's happening in the superannuation industry, and Anne-Marie's going to give us some more detail on that, but overall the super industry is a little bit better. I mean, the top 199 super funds, the overall percentage of female trustees is around 19.4%. But the fact is that that figure hasn't changed uh, or increased for five years. In fact, if you look at both public sector and industry funds, the percentage has dropped since 2005. So it's following that same trend as corporate Australia. The need to increase women at decision making level uh, was picked up by the ASX Corporate Governance Council. It would probably be about a year ago now. And some of you may be aware that they have amended their recommendations and guidelines. So as from the 1 January 2011, all publicly listed companies will be required to, report, uh, to set a target for the number of women on their board at senior executive level and throughout the organisation and to report transparently against that target um, each year. They'll report on what they call an if not, why not basis. So there has been really what's the first systemic intervention um, in this area. And it's fascinating to see that just the renewed focus at having these changes, which actually aren't even into effect, in effect yet, um, what impact they have had. And I see that in the Cooper review, um, one of, the, one of the recommendations is that a code of trustee governance be adopted with application to both trustee companies and trustee directors. And that it would in some way mimic what's happened 
um, through the ASX Corporate Governance Council, but it would reflect the unique context of a superannuation fund. And um, in that report, it notes that while the proposed code of trustee governance would not necessarily mandate a specific quota, the panel noted that a goal of at least 40% of directors being women would be in keeping with emerging international best practice. So there is a great a move to gender equality globally. We're part of a global movement. And I think it recognises the strong research which is emerging uh, about the strong correlation between increased representation of women at the senior level and improved corporate performance. And there's a lot of data about that now. McKinsey's, Bain, Goldman Sachs, Catalyst, there are any number of studies that point to that. We have a huge wastage of female talent in this country. There's no question about that. And there is no nation, government, um, industry or sector that can afford that kind of loss. And my point is, without some systemic intervention, we're really not going to turn this situation around. The fact is, solving the problem is difficult. It is complex. There's been a lot of good intentions um, over the last decade, but we really haven't changed the picture. Um, and I think part of that becomes, comes about because we're focused on fixing women rather than recognising that most of the discrimination that exists against women today, it's not overt. It's actually built into the systems, the cultures, the institutions that exist in Australia. And it's often a result of unconscious bias. So it's not someone deliberately making a decision which will disadvantage women. It's often unconscious. And, and it's necessary, that bias in a sense is necessary um, as a way of, a shorthand way of helping us understand complexity in the world. So we develop what they call gender schemas and then we make decisions based on that. But just in summary, the three obstacles um, to women's workplace progression, I like to think of them in the, these three ways. Firstly, belief barriers. So as a country, we hold certain um, cultural beliefs and one of them is the belief about what a good mother is in this country and most Australians grow up with the belief that a good mother is a mum who spends all her time with her kids and similarly what's the ideal worker look like? The ideal worker is someone who's available 24-7, no visible caring responsibilities, preferably male. Um, so you put those together and they're quite uh, and there's good research coming out of the University of Sydney on this now. They are constraining beliefs for women's progression in the workforce. They're cultural barriers often within organisations around the systems which can reproduce disadvantage for women. Many companies are starting to address those cultural barriers. But the third thing is we have structural barriers. Up until 1 January 2011, we haven't had a paid parental leave scheme nationally. And I don't know if any of you have experienced a childcare system in Australia, but really you need the CEO's job to actually pay for childcare if you live in Sydney or Melbourne. So unlike other countries that are doing well, we're still missing what I call the social infrastructure, which is necessary so that all the talent um, that exists in this country can participate to the extent that they want and need to. So solving this issue does require some systemic intervention. It requires us to really develop a new approach. And I just want to say a couple of things about that new approach. Um, firstly, I don't think our new approach should be confined to change amongst women. Because when I started in this job, I thought, well, it's women who are agitating for change. That's what's going to solve it. And the longer I was in this role, I thought, no, no. That's absolutely important, I'm not saying for a minute it isn't, but it's about men and women working in strong partnership. And that's, abs that's important as well, but I've moved away from that to a position where I think this is only going to change when men work with men to solve this problem. Because it is men that dominate nearly every institution in the country, particularly in corporate Australia, and I think if there is to be change, we need male CEOs, male leaders, um, <laughs> you know, championing that change. And by that I might mean, you know, working in different work practices, putting um, the, the case for change. 
And that's one of the reasons I established a few months ago um, a, an advisory group, which was really a group of 12 influential men or male leaders in this country who have agreed to take a personal um, a leadership role in changing this picture. And those 12 are Michael Luscombe from Woolworths, David Fody from Telstra, Stephen Fitzgerald, Goldman Sachs, Ralph Norris, CBA, Stephen Roberts, Citibank, Gordon Kance, um, on who's ex line Nathan, but on the board of Westpac, Kevin McCann, Origin, Rob Elston, CEO of the Stock Exchange, Guillaume Swigers from Deloitte, David Peaver from Rio, Alan Joyce from Qantas, and Glenn Borum from, from IBM. And those men have come together as a group and committed to individually and collectively using their influence um, and personal commitment to really elevate the issue of women's representation at senior levels on the national agenda. So to work in their organisations, but really to take a wider advocacy role than that. And that's my point. We need male leaders all across this country taking up the advocacy mantle and leading by example. And there's been many examples of that over the last um, few months. Just to give you an idea of a couple, um, Guillaume Swigas, for example, has hosted numerous events to discuss early adoption of the ASX corporate governance requirements with male CEOs and directors across this country. Um, I went to one of them and one male chair person was heard to lament, well, we tried a woman once, but no, it didn't work. Um, Michael Luscombe, that's like often people say to me, oh, well, we tried a part-time work once, but hmm, no, it didn't work. So we're going to throw out the whole model of part-time work. Um, it just doesn't make sense. Uh, Michael Luscombe has announced that Woolworths will commit to a target of 33% at senior executive and board level by 2015, um, and a number of major um, ASX uh, 200 companies either have or will shortly early adopt the ASX corporate governance requirements. Glenn Borum, as a CEO of IBM, has brought together all the captains of the industry in the IT area to make plans about voluntarily adopting the ASX corporate governance reporting requirements. Um, Stephen Fitzgerald, the CEO of Goldman Sachs, has produced detailed analysis, which actually demonstrates that if we could reduce this gap in women's workforce participation, it would provide a boost of 11% to GDP. And he's really added to that body of evidence about this being strong and good business sense. Um, and there are many, many others too numerous to mention. But my point is not that women shouldn't continue to advocate for change. That's important. That's how, in a sense, movements start. But I do think there's a growing recognition that solving this issue is everyone's business. It's not just women's business, and that's got to be a step in the right direction. Secondly, we need to see the issue of women's leadership in the broader context of gender equality. Um, and people say to me, but you're a human rights uh, commissioner, why do you care about educated, articulate women on boards? Um, and let's be clear, it isn't an issue which threatens basic human requirements like housing, food and safety. But there is a strong connection between how women are treated in corporate and business life and how women are treated everywhere across our country and internationally. The statistics on women's leadership and our progress towards gender equality, um, just like our record on addressing violence against women's sexual harassment, the gender pay gap and the gap in retirement savings, they're all moving, uh, help us move to a place of greater equality. And it was so interesting, this morning I went to see a couple of the domestic violence services here in um, the Gold Coast. And it was one of the early questions that um, these women at, at the services asked me. They said, what's happening around women on boards um, in corporate Australia? So I do think there's a strong symbolism there as well. Um, as the president of Catalyst, Eileen Lang recently said, she said, look, until women are equitably represented in leadership in the private economic sphere, they will be marginalised in every other arena. But whether you buy that argument of equality or not doesn't really matter because the fact is um, when you look at the research that I talked about which correlates increased corporate performance with greater gender diversity at the senior level, whether you want to buy the justice and equality argument or the profitability argument, the outcome's the same. We still need more women at the top. 
And then my third observation is that we need to be clear about where it is that we want to get to. Um, and for me, as a mother of a, a boy and a girl, that is to a future where neither of my children's choices around work or family will be dictated by their gender. But if you look at it in a corporate sense, um, we need to build critical mass, I think, in the presence of the existing barriers. Because it's critical mass that will create the change that we're seeking, not the other way around. And I think that's a really important point, that critical mass will create the change rather than the change creating critical mass. We need to achieve critical mass in senior roles, and when we've done that, the diverse viewpoints and appreciation of difference will actually occur. And for me, in the corporate sphere, this means a minimum of 40% of each gender on Australian publicly listed corporate boards within five years. And I think my final observation is that once we've agreed what it is that we want, then we need to put all the options on the table so that we can work out how to get it. So that includes targets um, and it probably includes quotas because it's our ambitions that def should define the methods and the tools, not the other way around. Without a significant change to what we're doing now, the only thing we should expect is more of the same. And just a, uh, two words on um, targets. In efforts to promote women into leadership roles, there's no doubt in my mind that there was a major turning point in September last year. Um, up until then, the prevailing view was, look, the system's merit-based. The problem's with the women. They just won't, or, or they, they either couldn't or wouldn't step up and take high office. So in September last year, there was a major conference um, about women on boards. And there was absolute agreement at that conference that not only was Australia going backwards, but that we were likely to, free, that we were likely to descend into free fall without systemic intervention. And at that time, I agonised whether I would use the Q word, yes, the quota word, and call for um, the introduction of a mandatory quota for women on boards. And after much consideration, I decided that a lively debate about targets, about quotas, was what we needed. It was an important vehicle for identifying some common ground and for calling business to, act, to action. And it is really reassuring now to see that targets, at least, and quotas, to, to maybe a lesser extent, but these words have, been come, have become part of a mainstream debate and they are being used by many people, including senior male and uh, female board directors. So change is happening. Um, we have made real progress. The AICD st statistics show that in the whole of last year, only 5% of board appointments to ASX 200 companies were female. 5%, that compares to 27% by August 2010. And you remember this is prior to the ASX corporate governance reforms actually coming into being. They don't start till 1 January 2011. So it's a four-fold increase actually when you look at the numbers. Um, and we're now at 10% of women on ASX 200 boards. So these are promising signs, there's no question. But I think we'd all agree that 10% is not enough. We need to think about what else we must do what success looks like, and how we can encourage male leadership on changing this um, issue. And I would like to leave with a question today is there has been progress, but will it be enough? That's the question for the panel as well. So thank you. now. Um, I know that Liz touched on superannuation boards, Anne-Marie, but um, can you maybe uh, delve a little bit deeper into superannuation boards and women on those boards, but also I think that there is often a perception in the superannuation industry that there are lots of set women in very senior roles, particularly at CEO level. But I don't think this is actually the case. I think it's a bit of a myth. So I wondered if you had any thoughts on those two things. 
Thanks, Fiona. Um, and Ms outlined that of the top 199 funds, 19.4% um, of directors are women. And if you break that up into the different sectors, corporate funds have 21.2%, public sector funds have 22%, industry funds have 18.9% and retail funds have 17%. So you can see they're all um, well short of any targets if we were to adopt, the, for example, what came out in the Cooper Review. And if you look at the funds that actually have got 40% of women directors on their boards, and these are not percentages, these are numbers, Corporate funds, five. Industry funds, four. Public sector funds, one. And retail funds, 10. So you can see that if we were to move to um, any sort of target in this area, that uh, there's quite a lot to be, to be done. Funds that have no women trustees. Corporate funds, these are numbers, not percentages. Seven. Industry funds, 12 public sector funds three and retail funds 22. And the stats for those um, figures came from APRA and also from an organisation Women on Boards. So we do have a long way to go um, in the super industry in terms of, of women directors. Um, whilst we've got um, probably maybe a bit higher base than the corporate world to move from, um, there is still work to be done. And Fiona's question around CEOs, there are 10. I might have missed a couple of um, small funds that I'd be unaware of, but this came off the AIST database, but pretty much accords. It's not hard to uh, know who the 10 women CEOs are. Um, six are in industry funds, two are in public sector funds, and two are in corporate funds. Hester's has achieved gender diversity, and, it's, and that's including at your senior executive level and also in your board. So what are you doing at Hester that other superannuation funds aren't doing? Well, um, our board has been discussing um, the requirements for directors for quite some time. So we have a committee that's specifically um, designated to look at fund governance issues. So it's about our directors, their um, training requirements, the skills that they should have, and we've had a skills matrix in place for some time. And so those um, issues go to the actual skills and experience you'd expect a director to have. Um, geographic spread, because we're a national fund, we want directors from across the country, gender representation um, and the like. So we look at a range of factors. Um, directors come to our board through nominating organisations and this is sometimes put up as a barrier for um, getting gender representation. And uh, so we have discussions with our nominating organisations. They get a, um, a list of, you know, we have a document, expectations for HESTA directors that our guarantors get and uh, they are requested to take that into account when putting forward their nominees. Um, we also ask them to have a discussion with us about those nominees because we may be looking for specific skill sets, um, but we can look at the whole mix of those things that we're trying to achieve across the board. And I think we've been um, pretty successful in doing that. So 50% of our board are women. Uh, we have geographic spread across the country. I think the only state not represented, I guess wrong, is South Australia um, and the Northern Territory. So all the other states and territories we have a director from. And we have a range of skills and experience that meet um, the things that we want to be represented across all the directors on our board. And that skills matrix is, is assessed every year. And whenever we have casual vacancies or terms of office expire, uh, the letter that goes to guarantors is based on that skills matrix. So that's the way we've approached it, I guess, from a policy point of view. We don't have targets in our policy, um, but we certainly have strenuous discussion um, about it. Um, in terms of uh, the senior management at Hester, of my seven direct reports, four are women. Uh, of my staff, probably 60%, I didn't go through and count them, but I think it's about 60, 65% are women. And again, that's no direct um, policy. We do have very good um, work family life um, you know, policies at Hester, and I think that attracts um, candidates to us. We never have any problem when we advertise a job in getting applicants. Uh, so I think that that shows that you know we, we walk the talk a bit. And I think they're the issues that need to be addressed because if you don't provide the wor right working conditions for women to be able to continue in their careers, then that's one of the barriers that Liz refers to. And you have to be able to, to look at you know flexible 
um, working arrangements and a whole lot of other arrangements um, around around work and have a bit of an adaptability attitude to it. And, and we can't do it, in, you know, I don't say we're perfect and we can't do it in every case, um, but we try as far as we can to be able to accommodate um, those things. And that, that means you have very little staff turnover and, uh, and it leads to a whole lot of other, you know, productivity improvements across the organisation and I think that applies to any organisation. Thanks, Anne-Marie. Um, Susan, what's the state of play for women in the investment community? Yeah, the statistics aren't uh, that easy to find in Australia, but there was a recent study out in the US that showed uh, women constitute 16% of executives and board positions in the financial industry and more specifically in funds management, 10%. So I guess that's certainly very not not a critical mass at all. So, And that, that statistic's been unchanged for the last 10 years. So in funds management, not really going anywhere. And I guess even uh, in the hedge fund space, women are still something of a, a white tiger, I guess, in, in terms of hedge funds. Uh, only 3% of hedge funds, that $2 trillion industry, are women-led, so uh, very low. So research shows, and I think Liz touched on this, that um, female directors, in, in fact, improve governance within, uh, within a board. So why is this? If it is true, why, why is this? Yeah, I guess there's um, there there are quite a number of studies that have come come out in recent years. Is, is the uh, there's more examples of corporates more aggressively promoting uh, women to senior leadership positions, and and I think Liz touched on on some of those studies: increasing return on assets and equity and and, and profitability. Those studies back from 2001. The statistics are quite quite remarkable. Uh, so this number of theories uh, around that and, and I, I should say probably 30 percent is sort of a critical number of women on boards to, to start getting that that improvement in corporate performance there's a number of theories around I'd probably say there's two sort of areas where where you could see some the benefits of women uh, um, certainly in government governance and some of the studies show increased attendance at board level by women and that sort of encourages uh, uh, male attendance more um, attention to detail and monitoring and, and certainly there's a lot of studies around uh, 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 risk, attitudes to risk and and um, more focus on downside risk. So certainly women and men have different approaches in, in asking questions and and uh, there, there are sort of studies that in, that um, more women on boards uh, reduce the chance of a, of a company going bankrupt. So so there's some, something in the sort of risk, risk management side as well. Anne-Marie told us about what happens at HESTA. So what programs do you have, if any, in place at QIC to help promote women to senior levels and onto boards? Yeah, I guess we don't have explicit targets uh, either, but um, certainly at a senior leadership level, um, equity issues are, uh, um, are, are well promoted. And I would say one of the, one of the best strategies at QIC has been um, work-life balance uh, and the focus and the promotion of, of different strategies around managing your career. Women have options of, of um, being more, when they come back into the workforce after maternity leave to, to manage their career path. Maybe they work um, three days a week or four days a week. So even in my own in my own investment team, I have several women that are 0.6 of an FTE or 0.8 of an FTE. I've got a male who's a 0.9 of an FTE who, who has um, um, children uh, at home as well. So, uh, so yeah, just work-life uh, flexibility, I think, it, um, has been a success. I want to just talk about the issue of quotas because I have to say I was pretty surprised to see that 60% of people in this room thought that targets weren't, you know, uh, they were against them basically to get gender, gender diversity. Um, I know that we've seen in Norway, and you did touch on this Liz, but maybe you could expand on it a little bit about the approach that they'd taken to get to their 40% women. There is a difference between a target and a quota. A target is something that the business themselves or the fund or whatever sets themselves. The quota refers more to a mandate. It's mandatory in nature often, and it's imposed from from above. And that's what happened in Norway. Um, actually, the Conservative Party um, introduced a 40% quota, and 
they gave companies, I think, three years to achieve 40%, failing which um, there were financial penalties and the penalty regime went to uh, the point where you could be delisted from their, from their stock exchange. So it was very, um, you know, quite strict um, consequences from not complying. It was interesting, I met with a um, delegation of Norwegian parliamentarians last week, they came to see me um, in Sydney, and uh, discussions with the Conservatives, the Centre Party and the Socialists, they all agreed that the one thing that was having a very positive impact on their economy was the fact that they'd they were utilising all the talent that existed in the country. And even those that were very against a quota, and there's a whole lot of arguments against quotas, such as, such as well, you know, we'll just put someone in there because of their gender and a more appropriately skilled person, male will not be considered, the issues about where all these women are coming from. I mean, there's a whole range of arguments against it, but three years post quota, there seemed to be quite a deal of consensus that actually it was a thing to do, um, that it did, it had an impact on the strength of their economy. And one guy said to me, he said, oh, most people think our whole strength comes from oil. It doesn't. It comes from the fact that we use, utilise all the talent that exists in this country, which I thought was an interesting observation. Um, and the question is, does it still need to be in place? Because I see quotas as a, what I call a temporary special measure. They are a jolt to a system to realign the system. And I think that's one of the issues that Norway is considering as well. I mean, do we need, still need this legislation? Or three years on, um, we've achieved what we set out to achieve. Is that an enduring change? So. And I take it that Norway still exists. It hasn't fallen <laughs> off, the, off the planet. They haven't imploded, you know, nothing. No, business hasn't got up and walked yeah. away, which was another yeah. of the arguments. No, That's none right. of those things happened here. Surprise, surprise. Um, Anne-Marie, on the question of targets, we did talk about that in the Cooper review. While he didn't say that it would be mandatory, he does recommend that we do have an industry-wide code of governance. The, one of the things that it sets is a benchmark for 40% women on boards. Uh, what's your view on that and how it would be accepted and how long the, the, you know, the lead time should be to give people an opportunity to address the issue? Yeah, I'm more a supporter of targets than quotas. I've never been a supporter of quotas. Um, and I've worked in other affirmative action um, roles. I, you know, one of my jobs way back was to compile the first action plan for women in the teaching service in Victoria. And, um, and it had targets in it and they were achieved over a set period of time. And I think that that's a way to go. And I think it's important to talk about gender representation and not, you know, 50% of women. I think the way that um, Liz expressed and it's expressed in other countries is really important because we're actually talking about the pool from which directors, and I'm talking more specifically here about corporate boards, pool from which directors are drawn. It's not like there's this pool of directors and all of a sudden we've got to create this pool of women that comes from, you know, they're part of the drawing pool. And there might be other um, representation that's required from that drawing pool, but it's an equal number of men and women who we should be drawing um, directors from. So I don't know whether, uh, can I go on about my other pet thing? Um, and that is about, and Liz talked about this too, it's not about fixing women, you know, sending women off to professional development programs and mentoring programs so that they learn what the current culture is and men can assess whether they fit in and then they might get put up to boards, you know. It's a real insult to women to have some of those programs in place and whilst some of them I think are very well intentioned, to me, looking from the outside, that's what it's about. It's about whether you fit that mould. And what we're actually looking for is diversity of experience because that's what, you know, if you want to have the same experience, that doesn't change what the, you know, the areas of, particularly in the areas of corporate governance, and a lot of funds in this room have, have see the um, deficiencies in this area. So we've got to increase the diversity of experience and that's how you do it by having different experiences, not people being taught how to behave in the same way and have the same experience. So, so that's, I, I think that programs can be developed, but if they're, they need to be very specially um, targeted and not just create more of the same and just have a different gender. I don't think that's what we're out to, to achieve. Um, and the other um, area is, is research, and it's good to have research that shows that 
that women make a difference, but why should we have to have research? You know, we don't do research on all the males who are appointed to boards in 2005, and what's the output of the companies as a result of that, and how did they affect that performance? You know, you just don't see that. And so, again, you shouldn't have to prove that by putting one woman on a board, you know, you're going to get improved performance. I mean, when we had 50% directors at Hester, a reporter rang me and said, has your investment returns gone up? You know, the week after we reached 50%. And I said, like, what is it? And she said, oh, just the questions I was given from the editor, she, just the questions I was given from the editor. Anyway, um, but that, you get my point. It's, it's not about that. It's about drawing on the whole talent, as Liz said, across, you know, across the whole of the country and, uh, and having that diversity um, of experience. Okay. Um, Susan, what's your views about what are some of the solutions? I mean, do we really need to wait for regulation or legislation or quotas? What, what, what do you think we need to be doing that we're, that we're obviously not in Australia? Yeah, um, I guess if we don't make enough progress, I mean, that's the inevitable path. Uh, I think Japan was mentioned in Liz's talk, but um, I saw a recent paper on Japan and one reason for their um, complete underperformance in the last decade or two um, may well be linked to this issue as well. I think there's 1.7% of corporate executives in Japan are women. So that's uh, at the other end of the spectrum, I guess, to where Norway's at. Um, I just, uh, in terms of solutions, I think it's got to be multifaceted and Liz, or Liz has already touched on them. In terms of my particular area, funds management, we've got to avoid this big dropout rate of, of women. Um, we've got the education through to the degrees, less so in MBAs. Women are doing less MBAs in that second second degree um, area, but um, it's just avoiding that dropout uh, of, of women in, in finance. They're coming through through the education system, going into funds management, um, but but we're losing them thereafter. Uh, I guess one practical way that we've we've attempted to do that is, is as, a, as I said, just more work life um, flexibility, uh, more work uh, flexibility arra arrangements. Um, and, and I guess cultural issues in terms of yeah not not expecting you know women to uh, I guess compete uh, do the same same as, as, as men and, and be available 24 hours a day and and and, and travel uh, at the whim of a, hat, a drop of a hat and all that sort of thing so um, we're sort of coming to the end of the day but has anyone got any burning questions and yes Michael Firstly, thank you for the presentation. Secondly, many of the people in this room belong to an organisation called the Australian Council of Superannuation Investors, which is a member of the ASX Corporate Governance Council, and together with other investor groups led the way to change the guidelines. The ASX wasn't breaking its neck to do it. it. It was done because the investor group on the Corporate Governance Council in particular prepared the ground and forced the way and finalised the words of the... So that's just something that people here should know, that they played a significant role in having that, what I think is quite a watershed change, and one which led the AICD, the Institute of Directors, to take all of the measures that they've taken. We also had a round table with them at the beginning of the year about this very issue, including with a number of women directors who all said that the pipeline is the problem. Now, the pipeline's the problem because they're defining the pipeline as being former CEOs, former chief operating officers and former chief financial officers. They don't appear to understand that in the public sector, the health sector, science, education, just about every other sector of the economy and society, there are women in leading positions, governing positions. And I was talking to a friend, in, I might say that I come from a, a fund, I'm the chairman of a fund, which has a woman CEO and has three of the eight voting members are women. And I think we learn every time we have a meeting what the advantages are. So you don't have to sell me on the proposition. But it's very important that we don't allow those who hold the, the power on boards to define who their successors will be. Other people have to do it. The exit policy, and this is a funny way of asking a question, but the policy we've <laughs> taken is that the the ASX Corporate Governance Guidelines come into effect 1 January, so that means elections 11, 2011, 2012, 2013. Our policy is, and all of you at the moment are bound by the policy, those of you who are members, unless you want to change it, is that unless there are at least two or 25 per cent of directors on all the ASX 200 companies by the end of the 2014 elections, which gives them three elections to fix it, 
and they can add numbers to the board. So they don't have to displace them in, they can add numbers if they want to. Then we would agitate for whoever's in power. We'll ask Bob Catter for, um, <coughs> for um, quotas. And I understand all the arguments against quotas, but I do think that unless you draw the line somewhere, you'll just be back here every year talking about the same situation. So I guess my question is, do you agree with that? <laughs> you better get the, uh, all of the uh, big shareholders in line too. That means the fund managers sitting in this room who cast the vote. Not the directors of super funds, the fund managers, who the institutions who have the most say in the election of board members. Yes, I agree. Fiona, uh, Fiona could I just make yes, a okay. okay. I think it's so spot on what you what you've said. I mean, it's interesting. Norway, it was a minister for trade, the Conservative minister for trade, who actually um, brought in the quota legislation, but. The reason I think that statistic about women with profit and loss, women who are CFOs or, CFOs or whatever, that is dropping and we see there that it went from 7.5 to 5.9 in 2008. It's actually down, uh, if some figures from the other night, it's down around 3%. How are we going to build a pipeline when we define potential board directors as ex-CEOs, CFOs or whatever it is, we just won't. So I agree, we need to look at um, different, you know, a, a different way of solving the problem. Yep. Like and, a, 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 an adjunct to that is, we need to look at the, uh, the processes that headhunters use in terms of identifying women. And so, you know, most of the women in this room could give you the list of the women that the headhunters give to the boards, and they're the same group all the time, and they come from certain disciplines, usually accounting and law, or they've come through the, the um, positions that Michael outlined. And so what needs to happen is some different incentivisation of headhunters about the, the candidates they bring to the board um, so that they look broader than just the traditional um, areas as well. And I think another part of that, the reporting that's going to happen through the, um, the companies will have to report is actually in their annual report about these targets. It may be better that it's actually in the remuneration report because A, it will be looked at probably in more detail and B, um, it's an area that can be voted on. So I think that maybe that change might be something that AXI might want to take up, Michael, too, in their discussions, but something that we talked about um, more broadly. Okay. Dean. Uh, my comment is to Liz. Um, in my old life, I used to work with risk metrics, which I've met with hundreds of uh, boards on board succession issues and chairs and stuff. And I, I reckon you asked, could, they, could you do anything more? I reckon you actually need to think more than targets. You need to start thinking about targeting. There are so many dud directors out there who don't deserve their salaries. You should publish a list of the most uh, of the worst performing directors <laughs> and force them to justify their position. Because you can't have a discussion about filling quotas if you're not having the same discussion about performance. And if you want to start, start with the Goodman Group. How those guys have still got their jobs is beyond me. So. <laughs> Get acting to do something. Yes. <laughs> it's about corporate governance in this country. It's got to start with the regulator. Mm, okay. I'll take that as a comment, Alan. Um, uh, I'm being Tony Jones before he gets here. Uh, David had a question down here. Oh, hi, uh, David Whiteley from Industry Super Network. And I, I should uh, disclose early on that my wife's the. Um, Chair of the Women's Committee at the ACTU, so some of these debates are things which we uh, discuss quite regularly. Um, it's probably a question more uh, for Elizabeth, I think. It, it, the question of the role that men can actually play in, in furthering the debate, I'm interested in, in what some of the practical examples of that are. Certainly, I think an experience that I and others have had is sometimes when we, we, we try and make an effort, it's rebuffed um, or treated with a degree of cynicism or that we're just... Uh, um, or our motives are treated with some cynicism. So I'm, I'm interested in what you think um, things men can do. Yeah, it, it's a good point because a number of my male, you know, the group that I've set up have said they think this is the hardest thing 
they can do, or that they've ever done. In in fact, if they speak out, um, you know, they're it's women and men who are saying, oh, no, you can't do that. And if they don't speak out, well, no, you've got to speak out. So I take your point. It is hard to actually speak out on these issues, um, particularly if you're male. But I think, um, just to give you a practical example, flexible work or work-life balance, which Susan's been talking about, one of the initiatives she's, that she's been running in her organisation, to have a man working flexibly um, sends such a strong signal that you can be a serious player at work and an engaged dad or whatever it is, carer. Um, and it leads to attitudinal change. I think the problem for women is that, you know, any number of women with young children working flexibly is not going to change the culture of an organisation. We need men actually modelling the types of work practices that we're talking about here. Um, we need men just doing some of the advocacy. Um, and I mean, I run a lot of male-only focus groups as a Sex Discrimination Commissioner, and I do that to understand what are the pressures on men as well, particularly that pressure of being um, a primary breadwinner. Uh, gender equality will benefit both, both men and women, and I think we just, and therefore both men and women need to be a part of a conversation. So I think to send that message out quite strongly. I think most women that I talk to understand the importance of men's engagement. Okay, last question down here. Uh, my name's Ross Kendall, with, uh, I'm a journalist with Ethical Investor magazine. Just in terms of the progress, uh, I think equal pay came in in the early 70s and that still hasn't been achieved. I mean, what's going to, have you looked at any research about what happened there? I mean, in terms of the sort of gender roles, often women say, I'll stay at home because the man earns more. I'm just wondering, have you tied those together in any way? It's, it's absolutely right. In fact, we are, so yesterday was equal pay day. That means that women have to work 66 days more to achieve the same amount of money for, you know, equal pay for work of equal or comparable value. So not only have we not solved it, it's actually widening. In fact, it's the widest it's been since 1992. Um, so that issue around who makes the most money in families, that often drives the decisions around who works and who cares. Uh, and, you know, I often say if there's one thing I could do as a sex discrimination commissioner to solve this issue of women on boards, pretty much every gender equality issue you could look at in this country, it would be the better sharing of paid and unpaid work between men and women. That is absolutely at the heart of um, a lot of the issues that we're, we're trying to solve. I mean, the bad news is that we're, well, actually, we're a leading country in terms of what they call time usage um, diaries. So it's a leading research on how men and women spend their time. What that research tells us is that that hasn't changed in the last 20 years. And in fact, even during the GFC, when men's paid work dropped down, there wasn't a corresponding uplift in unpaid and work, which includes predominantly caring work. So. Uh, all these things are interconnected. I actually think driving hard on this agenda around women at decision-making level will have some byproducts. Hopefully, it will positively impact on pay inequity. We know it will because women will be promoted and in more senior roles. But yeah, each of the issues are interconnected. I mean. It is depressing when you sit there and I'm saying to this Norwegian delegation, well, you know, the great news is we're going to have a national paid parental leave scheme on 1 January 2011. And they said, yeah, we actually got ours in 1936. <laughs> um, so these things take a long journey and that's why I think we need to at least keep the discussion around quotas out there because Norway, they started with voluntary targets. but it didn't change the situation and that's why they went to quotas and that was almost a 10 year journey. We haven't got 10 years to wait. We need to access all the talent that exists in Australia. So I think we need to keep these discussions alive and that's what I encourage every one of you to do.